Good morning. I am Dr. Christopher Brown from Georgia Southern University, and I'm happy to be presenting a, uh, a work in progress for the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Scholar Biennial Conference hosted by the Jose Marti Institute at the University of Tampa. I'd like to first thank my colleagues and friends at the University of Tampa and uh, the Summer Scholar Program for allowing me to contribute, to participate, and then continue to build our, on our common interest in Jose Marti and Cuba. The presentation that I have today is entitled In the Same Pocket in Which I Carry 50 Rounds. And this uh, is a phrase that was, that references one of the final letters that Jose Marti had written prior to his death uh, in Cuba. He was um, essentially participating in the guerrilla campaign and uh, was killed in action. Um, and a few days prior, he wrote a letter to one of his friends uh, and in it, he referenced the fact that he carried a copy of Cicero, uh, was Plutarch's lives versions of Cicero in his pocket in which he carried his 50 rounds of ammunition. Uh, it, it struck me as at the time of the conference, uh, it struck me as um, pretty neat that he would you know, focus so much on political philosophy uh, and I, I sought to investigate a little bit more of, you know, the connection we had, what he had with Cicero and why it was so important that Cicero would be in his pocket. Um, you know, there's some obvious things that we might think about as far as, you know, the, you know, the anti-tyrannical, um, you know, Jose Martí's, you know, love of the Republic and, and whatnot. Um, and he certainly had influences outside of Cicero. So the, the caveat of this is that, you know, while this, this particular piece focuses on Cicero's influence on Jose Martí's con concept of la patria. Um, there were other influences and, you know, interestingly, there's a lot of those influences who are also influenced by Cicero. So I think that the multiple influences that Jose Martí has in this case, um, Cicero was clearly directly a very important one. Um, and I think a lot of folks are aware um, who are familiar with Jose Martí in, in any um, beyond a superficial level, recognize the influence of Cicero in some degree that, you know, he has recognized that it was important to, Cicero, uh, to Jose Marti's um, life um, directly. But I wanted to draw on this paper on some of the influences, particularly as they relate to Jose Marti's political construct of the Republic and the idea of the, the La Patria. So um, that's sort of the point of departure for this work. To situate the study more, uh, more specifically in my own research, uh, this is part of a uh, monograph that will be released with Paul Grave Macmillan in 2020 called The Democratization of Cuba. Part of the work that I'm in, in get introducing here uh, is really about sort of the, the process of understanding la patria and identity politics, uh, but also sort of trying to uh, figure out a, a larger um, umbrella, if you will, of, of what politics in Cuba might have looked like uh, over the course of time um, and what how they might end up uh, looking like that again. So basically trying to seek a pathway through the transitions that have occurred over the course of time in Cuba. In the book, the primary research question is, how does a transition from a command economy toward the free market occur so as to minimize the impact on the quality of life for the average citizens? And so I, I wanted to to recognize the transitions when they occur are often um, are often harmful to the folks in society that are most marginalized. And so uh, the, 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 the book recognizes that if there's an opportunity for uh, Cuba to transition, what way might be the best for Cuba to transition? Um, but this work really is generally um, related to my own interest in political philosophy. Although in, in George Southern, I teach international studies. I'm a scholar at comparative democratization. Uh, for my part, thinking in terms of a political philosophy, um, I have to go back to Machiavelli. And so in, in some of the work that I've done historically, um, academically, focuses on the idea about improving the qualities of democracy is something that I see is that Machiavelli was working with in his discourses. The most famous work, obviously, for Machiavelli is The Prince. And in The Prince, he outlines a theory or a, let's see, a practical uh, application perhaps of how one might, where there is an absence of democracy, 
be able to organize society in a way that promotes the most virtu, which allows a society that is autocratic or a dictatorship to be able to transition into something better, in which that case for Machiavelli was the Republic. So I don't necessarily see the prince uh, personally or professionally as, a, um, as antagonistic to his other work. I see it as a continuity. And so in this case, this is how this work is set up as well, is that I'm thinking in terms of the Cuban situation is if Cuba is to make the transition, um, by what means is, is it best capable to do that? And so the general overview of the book is here. Um, I'm going to focus more specifically on Jose Monti, since this is really the focus of the paper. Uh, in trying to wrestle with the larger issues from the, the book, I had written a, a work called Somos, Somos Todos Martianos, um, which really was looking at sort of the history of Cuba as a longer term struggle. So that sort of this long term of revolutionary struggle. So we, the early, uh, you know, revolutionary impacts of, you know, the 10 years war and all um, the historical Spanish colonization, the American intervention during, you know, the Spanish American war, Spanish American Cuban war, um, the, the process of uh, Cuba trying to wrestle with, you know, plat amendments and, um, you know, the, the Cold War period that comes after that, which leads us into the other revolution of 59. I see there's sort of these are continuous phases and I, I don't want to get any bogged down with any of the specifics here, but uh, Cuba seems to be developing over, over, a, um, over a long revolution working towards something, right? And I don't want to presume necessarily that it is working towards democracy. I, uh, I anticipate personally that it will, but professionally I'd be a little bit you know, skeptical to say that at this point in time. Uh, but what I would like to think about, how I would like to think about this sort of long revolution is that it's a process that's still yet unfolding. Um, and, you know, so the, for Cuba to have the opportunity to be able to um, be um, autonomous, to be able to have sovereignty in its own right, to be able to uh, govern its own affairs, I think is still something that is, that is, is yet to come. And, um, I, you know, I, I'm not without falling on any kind of economic sides. I'm not, I'm not sure that we're, we're near where we need to be with it yet. And these are things that are unfolding that are, that are frankly probably above my head. So if we look at the long view of Cuban history as something that's been divided the society, each, at each stage of this, there's been a division of Cuban society really over the key values and institutions. I don't know if all of these things are ultimately designed for the concept of liberty. Right, the concept of autonomy, the concept of sovereignty, that the Cuban revolution begins as an effort to be able to bring Cuba these things, all of the stages that have occurred um, through this long Cuban revolution have served only to divide the society. Another work that I did was about objection and reconciliation. So the idea of objection uh, represents a breakdown between the self and other. So the me that is not me, and probably the most classic example of this is the Frankenstein. Um, in the Cuban state can, uh, context, there's this sense of, you know, the, 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 all these divisions in society have separated Cubans uh, who all see themselves as Cubans and are fiercely patriotic in, in the context of Cubanidad. And yet they sort of recognize that there's a me that is not me. Um, and this, these divisions sort of pull apart at these idea, the idea of Cubanidad. So what would, what would it help to sort of reconcile? How will we have to reconcile these things? Um, in Marti's uh, articulation, clearly there's a moral obligation for, for Cubans to work together, for people to work together, for society to work together in order to have liberty, in order to be free. So another paper that I wrote after this, a uh, conference paper that I presented was recognizing again, this part of this long revolutionary era that suffering is the salt of glory is a phrase that, that Jose Marti had, had given us. And I thought in order to make sure that, to articulate more clearly what it is that we're doing when we are um, building a Cuba that is, um, that is essentially free from this revolutionary process. So a Cuba that is, has, has uh, come into its own, if you will recognizing that it must be something that is authentically Cuban. So Cubans must create this for themselves. And then uh, sovereignty, autonomy, and liberty become the suffering is the salt of glory. And so this, the notion that we, they can't change the past, but we'll have the opportunity to create the future 
Um, so the future is still pending. And then this, this culminates in um, Marty's dream, which is part of my final chapter uh, in the book, is, is envisioning a pathway toward this cultural reconciliation. So in the conference itself, as part of my, my final project, it was to ask the question about how does Marty Scuba outline a common basis in which to construct a culture of reconciliation to overcome the abjection of human identity. And what I did was in reading, in the readings um, throughout the entire course and the summer scholar program, was to outline things that I thought that Martis Kubani that he was really, he really spent time to articulate these concepts, which ultimately for me, pulling all these things together, um, some concepts that either predate Marti or were constructed by Marti in his writing. And you know, again, this is by no means the, the end word on all these things, but these are concepts that I thought that really fit together into his larger concept of Kubani that. Uh, Marti's own life and his own ability to re be reflective um, on his own experiences make this list a lot more uh, a lot more complex um, and certainly not exhaustive. But um, and then some norms that were convergent with Marti's, so an awareness of um, of Marti's sort of writings and more postmodern norms, and then other work that has been sort of articulated by Marti, but sort of work in progress. So in the first first column, I think. Marti's writing is particularly clear, uh, where he actually constructs an abstract, uh, constructs an idea, uh, even if it's abstract, and or takes an idea and makes it fit, makes it work, makes sense in the context of Guanida. Um, in the convergence, uh, Marti's writing comes out uh, of this, and then uh, the, the question of it fits well into these postmodern norms. So this is sort of where the world has, is, is shifting. Um, generally. And then the last part is a work in progress. So I think Marti articulates a lot of these, these aspects and then um, they become easier to sort of express later on. They get, they, get a, they get a better treatment elsewhere and then Marti sort of fits into this. So, um, you know, the, the idea of post-colonial identity um, and post-colonialism, Marti clearly fits into this concept, his writings fit into this concept, but it's something that's, that is, is articulated um, in more detail later. The, this particular work then um, looks at an, uh, his final days uh, and the impact that Cicero had on his life and why that was so significant for him to have Cicero with him, this idea of this moral ideal that human beings must be part of, they must participate in, in creating uh, and, and engaging political life. This is, is sort of a, a, the idea of the classical Greco-Roman notion that a life that is not, that a person who lives a life that isn't participatory in the affairs of, of their, their polis or their, the patria, right? It's not worth, it's not worth living. So uh, it's not a full life. And so this work looks at his concept of uh, la patria through the lens of his influence on Cicero, from Cicero. So um, some biographical similarities between um, Cicero and Jose Marti, both of the, 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 uh, men were born in sort of between two worlds. Uh, Marti, Spanish born in Cuba, uh, struggles with this different identities, recognizes the struggle of, of Cubans uh, in, in the context of, of Spain. Cicero himself was born as part of the equities class. Um, this was sort of a, a lesser tier, was not part of the first class. And sort of both of these guys represent something that is in between, um, not the top class, but somewhere else. And so they, they basically um, are able to use their education, use their uh, capabilities as, as orators, as lawyers, to be able to get themselves to, uh, to operate within the higher classes. Uh, both of them uh, celebrated a life of the mind. They were lifelong learners, they traveled. They were always investigating new, new, new phenomenon, new, new theories, new ideas fascinated uh, by the world around them. Both of them represented new men. Um, you know, they had been basically leaders in their group and they represented a sort of a new way of engaging, something that was different than the older traditions. Even if there was a recognition of the importance of the older traditions, there was also a realization that, the, that you know, this was a new time and new place that required a, a new man to be able to, to participate. So um, both of them were named father of their country 
by their colleagues. Um, and, you know, because of the work they did for patriotism, because of the work they did to attempt to promote the Republic. Both of them were unscrupulous. They're scrupulous with their civic responsibility. Uh, there was a sanctity of public life. There was a recognition that um, immorality was required to participate in public life. Both of them fought tyranny. Um, both of them were uh, against the Kaliismo or the, you know, the, the, the military uh, dictatorships that emerged in Rome or that were in the monarchical uh, militarism that existed in, um, in Spain, in Cuba, and then you know, as a threat later on to both of their regimes that this militarism would, would ultimately take over and undermine any chance at maintaining or establishing a republic. Neither of the guys were particularly uh, in, uh, keen to fight. Um, they recognized the need for just war and ultimately Marti does participate um, and uh, in his brief participation, it ultimately ends in his death. Um, when uh, Mar uh, Cicero ultimately decides to take a firm stance in opposition of, uh, of the dictator of Rome, it ultimately is the thing that kills him as well. And both of them end up dying for what they believe in. Uh, Jose Marti's young life, he uh, studied Greek and Roman classics as part of his early education. His uh, elementary school, primary school teacher, uh, Sixto Casado, was an expert in Latin translations and clearly would have imparted, not only Latin would have been an important part, uh, but also the, the work on uh, Greek and Roman uh, philosophy, including Cicero. His father he never had, the relationship with his father was, was problematic. Um, the uh, Maria de Mendive was, uh, the, basically becomes the father he never had. Mendive's pedagogy was heavily influenced by the liberal humanism of Felix Varela, um, who himself was an expert in philosophy and ethics, um, and then basically translated these values down, and then uh, to Men uh, Mendive, also to Jose Marti. And so while there were other influences around here, it, there seems to be a common thread. If we take even Varela, if we take the writers um, in, in the Spanish influence at the time, um, and even in his opportunity to go to Spain in uh, Zaragoza to study, there's significant influence on, uh, you know, the, the uh, for Marti from different areas. And many of these folks all have a common denominator, I'm focusing on, on Jose Mar or excuse me, on Cicero's work. Uh, not surprisingly, he earned his JD in civil and canon law uh, by completing his examinations on Cicero. Marti studied an awful lot, but in ethical and political terms, he would have to be clo more closely aligned with Stoicism. He keeps notebooks, what we refer to as pensamientos, akin to Marcus Aurelius's meditations. And the idea was meditations was something that you keep in hand and you make notes and things like that. And Marti's notebooks are essentially the same thing. Um, you know, notes, reminders to himself, um, you know, words or phrases that he thinks are interesting, that kind of stuff. Um, in his writing, there's a, over a thousand Greco-Roman references. Mainly these are used as illustrations, right? As I did to, to, to make connections to, to, to ideas by referring to sort of simplified concepts in uh, Greco-Roman work. His uh, recognition that humans are part of a larger community that follow natural law, uh, this radical dignity of man that emerges from Marti is, is no different than the concept that Cicero outlined. Um, the, 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 the cosmopolitanism for sure, but more specifically was the idea that, that reason um, inherent in humanity was natural, right? It was real, it was natural, and it was universal. This, in order to maintain uh, the dignity of man, the people's um, gravitation toward work or to uh, political life or to maintaining this morality had to be active. Um, it required personal sacrifice. There was a duty to sacrifice. And ultimately this duty included, included the idea that Stoics would teach us is that to die well and dying according to your principles. So uh, maintain your moral worth above all. Uh, Marti's new man concept, breaking free from the colonial frameworks of identity, you know, the idea of, of there's Spanish and there's Cuban and there's Creoles and there's Peninsulares and then race um, and ethnicity. 
for uh, Cicero as well, um, being sort of part of this Latinist, but not necessarily Roman, the equites, but not of the elites dominating the Senate. So there's this, there's this in-between concept for these folks. Um, the post-colonial concept of identity recognizes a sense of shared oppression, uh, the perversions of colonial rule, and that the, um, these perversions include the notion of race, right, and expectation of place, and then this sort of concept of identity that places people uh, in opposition to each other, so these divisions. And for Marti, uh, the idea of the solve altern, although the, uh, the, the, the questions of this are still being hashed out in post-colonialism, post and um, the, the literature in international studies today, but for the subaltern recognizing the sense that, you know, how do we construct a world in which we, uh, most of the terms by which we understand ourselves are those who have been given to us by the oppressor and the perversions of this oppression. So um, both of these folks attempt to build a new post-colonial identity that promotes the good parts, the virtues, right, and embraces these things. And Marti's concept of Nuestra America recognizes uh, this oppression and attempts to escape that by outlining a, a way forward that maintains sort of the moral dignity of, of the, those who are marginalized. Uh, both Marti and Cicero operate as mediators in their society, perhaps because they were able to operate between different worlds as new men. Uh, they were able to find a way to do this. Cicero says, you must first master law and philosophy and then become eloquent. This is precisely what Marti did uh, under Mendeve's instructions and, and others. In order to do this, to, you, you needed to promote the concept of justice in sort of the highest, uh, the highest way. Justice in this case is a cooperation among classes or the Concordia Ordinum, in which Marti attempts to do this by managing all the different factions. And he's successful in this, partially um, because of his personality, because of his, his eloquence, because of his ability to speak and his ability to connect to different types of folks. And this is probably one of his hardest missions is to bridge together these different contending factions in a similar way that Cicero had to as his time, you know, in, in the Senate um, and as, as a, a, uh, an active, Roman leader uh, to be able to manage these different pieces. So for Marti, the, the different factions, the different racial divides, the different approaches to revolution were all part of the challenges that Marti had to grapple with. Um, meanwhile, trying to build a larger organization to promote Cuban republicanism. Marti felt that people need to be useful to others. Um, their life would be defined by their utility. Uh, this is a, the concept of duty to others. Honor bound is, in, is, in her, is, uh, is seen early in his work on, on Abdallah when he's when he, in his youth, as he writes, that honor is more important in the cause of liberty than anything else. To promote, fight tyranny to promote republicanism is, is the only way to be able to create Cuban liberation. So this kind of the, the moral foundation leads to a, the liberty of, of humanity. Part of this is a moral commitment to public service that human beings must participate. Uh, and there's no other way that we could do this. So the challenge in Calismo or Caesarism is the only way to maintain the human dignity. Uh, and this is, this is uh, echoed through Cicero's work as well. So Marti is, is following up. More specifically, Cicero is seen as sort of trying to defend the Republic in its last days. Marti is seen as trying to construct the Republic. So if we're going to look at the, what political systems that Marti might have put in place in the aftermath of um, had he survived and the revolution had gone in a different direction. I think we can look closely at the structure of the PRC. Uh, in particular, we could look at the readings on the bases and to the Tampa resolutions, where we see that Jose Marti creates ascending associations, which is a very Republican notion, that it includes a holistic civil social element and it's not just about the politics, it's that people live in a community and that politics needs to be thought of in a more broad concept. We need to be able to recognize each other, work together, and be, be able to build this common identity, build this understanding. And so this virtue-based communities, and, I, and in this context, I, I do not mean religious 
virtue. I mean, virtue in a very Roman moral sense, um, you know, very stoic sense. So we have these education becomes critical to Marti and he writes on education. He speaks a lot about education and he himself is a representative of this message. Uh, mutual aid so societies uh, ex are an expression of communitarian, uh, communitarianism, right, which in stands in stark contrast to Yankee individualism, where basically, you know, you're on your own to make it type thing. Um, everybody can do it, you just have to figure it out. And then in the you know, communitarian concept is, it takes a village, that we need to work together, that there's a, there's a sense of us as a community, and that we have, a, we have an obligation to each other. And ultimately, that it's an inclusive republic, that there, those factions that are part of the Republic need to be managed. And in particular, there's a recognition of the inherent human dignity. So inclusion in terms of all the classes, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, and even in terms of gender. And so when he writes his with all and for the good of all, this is sort of the, the, the message about what the Republic has to offer. Promoting civic virtue as the core of a well-run political community that is a holistic endeavor. And from that, only good citizens can only emerge from a republic, but that republic has to be built on virtue and character. So at the end of his life, uh, he dies uh, in Cuba with the uh, life of Cicero in his pocket, you know, the carrying the 50 rounds at Dos Rios. And the question then remains is what would the Republic have looked like had Marti uh, survived? And this is one of the things that was sort of rattling around in my brain during the summer, uh, summer scholar program is, you know, what would it have looked like? There's this lament that, you know, he died and we'll never know. And so I thought, you know, to me, maybe we could tease some things out based on, you know, what he's written already. With everything that I've said so far, if I'm going to sort of consolidate this down, uh, Marti's Republic would would embrace universal suffrage. And given his, um, given his commitment for uh, participation, I would expect that it would be a mandatory participation. It would be a democratic structure and would be inclusive. So there would be, there would be everyone will be able to participate and everyone be, would be expected to participate. Um, it had to go through a republic. There was no other way for freedom for liberty to, to uh, succeed. And it would be based probably closely on the ascending associations of the PRC. So at each stage of the Republic, there would be smaller associations that would lead up to larger ones to be more representative, giving the people more of an opportunity to express themselves, to be able to participate more, thereby inc increasing the amount of liberation of freedom that people were able to, be, to, to participate. So, um, his concept of citizenship would be Latinist and inclusive, but moral, and this is the idea of the, the, the Roman concept of civitas, so that there are moral connections to being part of Cuba. Being, having Cubanidad or participating in Cubanidad comes with a moral commitment. It's not just the citizen. There's expectations. It's not a piece of paper. It's expectations of this is who we are and this is how we act. We do work together. We promote engaged, active citizenship. We cultivate virtue. We support each other. We are inclusive. We can only do this through democracy. We can only do this through, uh, you know, a, the form of a republic. Uh, and then, if you look at the PRC again, I think it, it's probably the best real-world applied framework for that. So la patria then uh, is an autonomous, sovereign, and liberated political entity which embodies the right virtues, advances the the providential quest toward freedom of which all humanity is intrinsically linked. So there is at core a general goodness of man. This goodness has been corrupted by uh, people who promote poor characters, those who people put power over the community, people who put fame or wealth over, uh, over others. So this corruption of colonization has undermined the general goodness. Education is an opportunity that should be a moral education, a virtue education, a patriotic education, but an ethical civil service emerges out of this if we, if we teach people the right things to, to work together. Um, in, this, in this way, we can structure justice via a free republic that promotes human liberty. And this would be, in Ortiz's words, in a new and sincerely democratic society. So I would like to thank everyone again for the opportunity to present at this conference for the opportunity to continue 
to contribute to the discussion as a discourse community of scholars uh, on Jose Marti and on Cuba and on democratization in general. So thank you very much. Please see my email below if anyone has any questions. I will be happy to discuss any of these things further. Um, hopefully uh, the work will be in print by the end of 2020.